Hello and welcome to Cartoon Cosmonauts, a podcast all about animated short films and their creators. Each episode will feature a new guest, giving us the lowdown on their approach to making animation. I'm your host, Joseph Orr, and my hope is that you leave this podcast with some insights into how animated films come together, but also with some tips that help to inspire your own creative works. A quick reminder that this podcast is available on all major podcasting platforms, as well as on YouTube as a video interview. On this episode of Cartoon Cosmonauts, I'm pleased to welcome special guest Sean Willis, aka Silly Penton. Sean is a stop motion animator, best known for his Lego brick films on YouTube, such as Benny and Lee and his History of Brick Film series. The Benny and Lee series has spanned over 20 episodes, all of which can be seen on the Silly Penta YouTube page. Today we are going to talk to Sean about his animation process by focusing on one short in particular, Benny and Lee Parallel Panic. This short was released in December 2016 and has a runtime of exactly 15 minutes. Sean wrote and directed it with his brother Brian and it won the 2016 Brick Filmers Guild Film Festival Best Film and Best Screenplay Award. So if you haven't seen it already, I suggest you pause this podcast now, follow the link in the description below and watch this terrific short. So then you can follow along as we discuss it. But for now, let's get into it and welcome Sean onto the show. Sean, welcome. Thanks for having me. I always like to, you know, discuss the uh, the nitty gritty of brick filming. Oh, absolutely. People. My kind of first question to you was just a very general, I suppose, how did you uh, kind of get into animation? Like what was your first sort of, was it always with Lego or or did you try something else at the start? Well, basically ever since I can remember, I was drawing comics you know just obviously crude drawings but just kind of for the sake of you know funny ideas or just d- making storylines you know making things up as a kid and then eventually uh when i mean i saw a couple of things on the internet before youtube uh and i, I experimented a couple of times you know like most people uh of a certain age you know once they get their hands on a camcorder they they do the whole like on off like you know <laughs> a car will drive across the screen like really jittery, slowly. But yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I did like one or two of those um with with lego I, I i guess i was always into lego uh so that was just kind of the the obvious thing like i didn't really put much thought into into it it was just it was around so i i'd use it for experiments like that brilliant uh but basically how i really started was once youtube came along an early featured video was um circle circle dot dot by blunty and blunty since 2002 was one of the most popular and influential brick filmers and then he he had another basically a resurgence once youtube came along he was one of the first people to upload his brick films to youtube and had a second round of popularity basically so he was very visible and basically everyone who started at the time i did were influenced by blunty and uh so yeah so this film was on the front page of youtube and that's how i found it and just kind of sparked something there you were like yeah I think I, I looked at his channel and saw his other brick films, but at the same time, he'd uploaded a, a a like brick film 101 type of video, you know, explaining the basics. And that's kind of how I learned like, oh, this, you know, stop motion it, and, you know, setting everything up and all. It's something you can you could do yourself. Uh, OK, brilliant. And it was that yeah, was that so something you, that you were kind of um, looking at with the with the kind of camcorder or were you using a, a kind of a. Um, a, a different camera at that stage or something uh, i think the first animation tests i made were like they were recorded all as one video file on a i guess a camcorder like a like a mini disc camcorder oh wow uh, so okay, it's cool. one big long video where you know my hands would come in and, and they'd go out again and and then then i'd get that on the computer and basically screen grab every individual frame out of the, the video file wow <laughs> which was a you know really really bad way of doing things. Jeez, that Um, must have taken a while. Yeah, it took forever, but it was basically, you know, it's kind of like you don't think about how how bad of a way it is if it's the only way you you have available or the only thing you've done up to that point. That's very true. I mean, that was the the only way to do it at the time. So you're like, well, I just, this is how much work that needs to be done, so I'm going to do it. Okay, cool. I mean, you know, if I'd looked into it more, if I'd found the, the forum and stuff before I'd done any of that, then I would have learned about webcams and software. But, you know, I just didn't, I just basically started as soon as I discovered the idea with whatever I had lying around. 
That's and I think that's one of the really nice things about because I know brick films kind of like a, a, a sub genre basically of stop motion but I think that's the really nice thing about stop motion is that there is a very like you know it's not you need this program like a traditional say 2D animation you need this program before you can start doing anything with stop motion mm -hmm. There's so many different ways like you said just shooting video and having your hands and having to take that out afterwards okay yeah. and was that were you mostly kind of doing that um kind of with lego or did you try out any kind of like other action figures or clay or stuff like that or was it all lego no it was always lego i mean i guess because i found brick filming and i already had lego and liked lego uh, i mean but by, by that point i was kind of you know starting to you know i wasn't so much interested in lego anymore uh it, that that interest was starting to wane but i still had it so okay. brick filming kind of revived that you know brilliant um, and you have like and, a ready-made uh, sort of i suppose cast and uh, yeah. equipment in lego form exactly, so you're yeah. like why not you can start seeing things going oh i wonder what stories i can make with these that kind of thing mm -hmm. and i okay. guess i just you know i took to lego and brick filming specifically because i was already familiar with you know how, how the system worked and you recognize the the faces like the, the prints and the, the shapes of the bricks and all that's very nostalgic and there uh, absolutely and yeah, i think I there's started watching all the other brick films i could find so i just you know i took to brick filming in particular rather than stop motion in general i suppose okay brilliant and there is i have to say the the youtube from any um from any kind of brick filming i've done the youtube commun community when it comes to brick filming is like an incredibly positive place because there's such a, a thing on the internet where you put something up and sometimes i, I know a lot of people are just like just disable the comments straight away because it's going to be brutal but i've, I've always found the opposite that I, in, particularly with brick films all you get is you know people if they are saying something it's normally constructive criticism like you know mm -hmm. your your lights a little bit uh, it's it's kind of jittery or you need to kind of smooth out your animation but even at that you have people kind of linking you sort of tutorials and things like that was that yeah. your experience at the start or was it was it was it different well as far as i remember i think i i had uploaded something like maybe the first thing i ever uploaded on youtube i got one negative comment and then removed the video <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's um, tough because you're putting yourself out there and especially yeah. when you're you know uh you know youtube obviously is a very relatively new thing at the time so mm -hmm. uh, one like, negative comment. you're still a kid you've, you're not used to that you've never really experienced that before but then when, once i found the forum and started posting videos in the forum the 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 response was much more constructive you know within the the community constructive criticism has always been pushed really hard yeah um, there seems to be a really nice kind of bar of acceptance for that and what kind yeah. of forums was there anyone specifically that you were posting to or well at the time it was brickfilms.com and i was yes. on there for about a year before it kind of you know went down the toilet <laughs> um but yeah so i started seeing constructive criticism and and that was really really helpful and informative and you know i was kind of thinking like wow i, I never thought about this uh, so I, I do think that, you know, that even though I, even though I feel like I kind of improved, didn't improve much for a long time, the, the minor improvements I did make early on were due to the, the, the feedback I got on the forum. Okay. You know, that's, I can that's still very remember interesting. specific comments that kind of blew my mind at the time. Like, wow, that's such a good idea. <laughs> yeah. It's almost, it's a case of a, uh, sometimes like many sort of uh, celebrities within the brick filming community. I, I always remember, uh, people you know that you would kind of see as sort of top flight brick filmers and then if there's a comment posted by one of them on your videos it's like being plucked out of like you know some sort of hollywood exec saying like yeah. yes and you're like oh that just kind of fans the flames and away you go especially at that time in 2007 there was still like there weren't that many films there weren't as many films being posted now as there are now so like it still felt like you could post something on the forum and literally everyone could see it. So, you know, I'd be posting really, really early videos and be getting comments from people I was watching, you know, like Mind Game and Captain Bulldog and uh, okay, wow. plenty of other names that I'd remember that people mightn't be familiar with anymore. I suppose <laughs> but, you know, I, I absolutely couldn't believe it at the time. That's the thing. And yeah. I suppose back then it was like you, exactly like you said, a smaller pool, but maybe there was like the, the amount of people watching everyone's videos the the rates were higher mm -hmm. whereas like you said yeah. nowadays there's so many brick films out there and kind of sub genres of whether it's you know sort of trailer remakes or things like that that there's like a whole almost an industry yeah. in there where it, it's impossible to see everything 
And of course, you know, with so many people, it's kind of hard to invest the time to, you know, go into detail and provide constructive criticism on every little aspect. If there's that many people you have to invest in, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's tough to share the kind of resources around and stuff. Yeah. Okay. And just, I suppose, on um, while we're on your, your YouTube te- channel, your YouTube name, uh, Silly Penta, where did that where did that come from? So before the YouTube channel, I was online. I was always Penta, some variation on Penta, like Penta 1000, something along those lines. And that was just named after a character in Crash Team Racing on the PS1. Oh, wow. As you can see, <laughs> if you can see the video, I've, you know, I like games. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it's a pretty impressive yeah. collection behind you. And which, uh, I, geez, that's terrible because I, I was a huge fan of Crash Team Racing. And I don't remember which one was the Penta character. It was a secret character. <laughs> oh, OK. See, I was dreadful I for doing any kind of missions. I just loved the yeah. multiplayer aspect of that. But uh, OK, cool. I think you might have had to 100 percent the game to unlock Penta. I'm not sure. Really? It, was, it was a penguin character with the, the highest stats. But that's and, cool. Uh, I didn't know that. I've, I've, I've always been into just, you know, there's, there's plenty of video game references in, in my brick films. So it's pretty natural that I just named my, I just took an online handle that was a ca- video game character name. But the, the silly part comes from a, a, a friend who at the time was online as Silly Jim. And at some point we had this idea that the two of us would make videos together and upload them to YouTube. So we made this joint YouTube account and combined Silly Jim and Penta into Silly Penta. But then, you know, nothing happened after that. So eventually, once I started making brick films, I already had this channel that was inactive. So I just thought, oh, I'll just put them on here. I'll and then ever since that. then, I've been silly, Penta. Okay, brilliant. Wow, that's a, it's so nice uh, when there's a, a kind of a story behind it. Because, you know, they sometimes, you know, when you're coming up with a YouTube name, sometimes you're creating the channel and you're like, oh, yeah, I have to think of a name. And it's just like, whatever's in the room, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, whereas I, I really like there's, there's that kind of history behind it. And yeah, I was a huge Crash, Crash Team Racing fan on the PlayStation, but yeah, obviously yeah, I, I never got that far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was yeah. pure multiplayer. Uh, so I'll have to go back, revisit that, see if I can unlock that uh, elusive character. Mm-hmm. And, and of I course, suppose... Silly Penta is kind of a strange name. You know, whenever somebody asks my YouTube channel name, and I'm like, oh, it's it's Silly Penta. They're kind of like, mm, okay, that's weird. But yeah, <laughs> I like that it's very distinctive. You know, if you type it into the YouTube search, nothing else is going to come up. <laughs> that's the thing, because there's certain words that I think at the time you're thinking, oh, you know, oh, this, you know, this sounds cool or this feels right or I associate with this character. But all of a sudden, exactly like you said, it kind of muddies the water then because there's so many times someone has told me, oh, look up the videos by this person. And I typed it into the YouTube bar and I get, you know, 50,000 different videos, none of which look like they're brick films. Yeah. So exactly that. When you type Silly Penta, you know, your channel, uh, for me anyway, comes up the top. So it's a nice kind of way of being a little bit distinctive. Yeah. Like I I think in recent years, there's like a popular streamer just called Penta. So, you know, Uh, convenient for me now that like, yeah, the, if you type in silly Penta, then nothing else, nothing else Penta related will come up. Yeah, it's just it's just narrowing in on you, which is nice. Yeah. OK, brilliant. And I suppose just um, kind of you're talking about there, I suppose, your love of uh, video games and, and kind of like references that you've kind of sort of baked into your, your brick films. But is there any, I suppose, animated movies or TV shows in particular that you like really kind of had an impact with you growing up? Well, I think as with most everyone, the Wallace and Gromit shorts are yeah. probably the most influential for stop motion just old cartoons in general like I, if we're going to talk about parallel panic i feel like parallel panic is a uh, very much cartoon like but i i kind of feel like i'm very bad about actually watching animated films or shows you know i gra- gravitate more towards live action i guess because in doing stop motion you know you're actually filming with a, a real camera and lenses and with a physical set so I prefer to take influence from like how things are photographed. Um, okay, brilliant. And would there be any but, films or TV shows in particular that that spring to mind in terms of like what kind of inspires you or inspiration, that kind of stuff? Well, most recently I made Tiger Trouble 2, which, you know, is, looks a lot different than anything I made before intentionally. And of course, was just like made, <laughs> made a lot better. And the two biggest influences on that were the shining for the like the natural light look and the, the well the way the set looks is kind of like the shining hotel mixed with courtrooms 
I just liked how it had all the lights dotted around and, and the big windows that are like kind of flared out. But also uh, M by Fritz Lang, which is from 1931, I think. But wow. it felt like, you know, when you're making a film and you kind of think like, I can't make every shot really good because it would take too long. <laughs> but when I was watching M, it kind of felt like, wow, it seems like every shot here, they're, they're putting as much into it as possible to make it a standout shot. You know, yeah, they're trying to do themselves almost every yeah. one. So that, that was kind of eye opening in terms of like, hmm, maybe I could make a film where I'm actually trying really hard on literally every shot. So that's that was what I was aiming for with Tiger Trouble 2. Uh, you know, hopefully there's there's very few kind of filler shots. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I think that's it's it's such a nice thing to, to hear that, that your kind of sort of film references, I suppose, and things like that are, are more live action because I think that's the, the kind of beautiful thing about film and especially when it comes to stop motion because you're dealing with practical sets in a sense you know what I mean there is a blurred line between you know a lot of big budgeted films still use miniatures and although they're not necessarily always filming stop motion but there is that sense of like you know there's that crossover line so you kind of mentioned parallel panic there and I suppose a big part of what I'm trying to do in this podcast is hear a little bit about you as a as an animator and your backstory but then also try and focus on one of your shorts and the kind of one that I picked the one that stood out the most to me was the Benny and Lee and Parallel Panic and I would for anyone who's listening and hasn't seen it yet I am going to leave a link to it in the description so if you haven't seen it I would definitely recommend watching it before this section just so you can kind of have a feel for for what we're talking about but I suppose just to set the scene Sean could you Kind of maybe give us a, a synopsis or an overview of uh, of Parallel Panic. I guess I should, uh, you know, explain the behind the duo aspect to it. You know, as I was, I was talking about starting in 07 and being influenced by Blunty, and um, Blunty had two duo series, one of which was Steve and Dave, which is, you know, which was really influential in from 02 to like 04 in brick filming. And then he, Meat Space was in 07. And because he had all this influence since 02, there was a bunch of other duos that came along that were influenced by Steve and Dave, such as uh, Kevin and Mr. Tater and um, the film Out of Time by uh, Chris Salt and um, Ben and Andy, Alex and Derek. Uh, there's, there's loads of them. But basically, and th then they all got uploaded to YouTube, you know, 06, 07. So anyone starting around then would see these. So everyone starting at this time it was just the done thing. Like everyone saw that every big filmer had a duo. So we all thought, okay, well, I have to make a duo now. So you just I pick two names out of thin air. Yeah. And, and, you know, any kid making brick films at that point would be making trailers like, oh, you know, X and Y coming soon. And just be two guys and, you know, one or two walls just doing random stuff. And a lot of these never even, you know, became actual series. They might just be a series trailer. Uh, but yeah, so... Benny and Lee was, was what my brother and I came up with. And, you know, all of our early animation tests were just Benny and Lee coming soon. Uh, it is fun, isn't it? When you're, when you're doing a test rather than kind of, uh, you know, saying here's test footage. Sometimes it was nicer to do it as a trailer, even if, you know, in your heart, you knew maybe this isn't going to actually be a film. Strangely enough, some of the early animation tests I uploaded to YouTube in 07, they actually have like way more views than films from the same time. I suppose, especially with brick filming, there's a real appetite for kind of uh, like people seeing behind the scenes, like tutorials or seeing how you did something. Yeah, I do like leaving old videos up, you know, public. People can just go back and see how you started. But so basically, you know, by the time I would have gotten to brickfilms.com and posting these tests at Benny and Lee, anyone around at the time would just think, oh, it's another duo that will never go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, you know? Here's another duo. <laughs> yeah, but we just kept making them. And then um, people kind of actually talked to them pretty early. By the time we were releasing like Benny and Lee episode three and four, there was a couple of people on the forum, including some big names that we looked up to, you know, who were saying like, well, these, these are, you know, funny and wacky. Like they're a bit more strange than, than the other duos that people are making. Yeah, there's um, it definitely like, I, I think I really, that's the two big things I really drew, was drawn to with Benny and Lee was obviously the Irish accents because mm -hmm also being from Ireland most of what I was watching is brick films and I, I joined YouTube a, a lot later I don't think my first video was till maybe 2016 2017 but hearing that Irish accent 
was not something I was accustomed to, it was, you know, predominantly American. So all of a sudden there was a part of me that was like, oh, that's, yeah, I know that accent. Uh, I, I was the same. that When I started, there was two Irish brick filmers in the community. And, you know, once I realized that, like I was kind of, yeah, I guess drawn to that, just thinking oh, that's interesting because there's other Irish brick filmers and yeah. And the, the, of course, they had uh, duos as well. <laughs> okay, so I, I rival duos. Their videos. Yeah, it is. And the, the other thing about yours that I was kind of, I suppose, stood out to me was that kind of offbeat kind of comedy. Some of that probably came from the fact that I was making everything with my brother uh, rather than just making it by myself. So like loads of things we'd put in just because it, it amused us, you know, like we weren't we, we knew fine well that a lot of it wouldn't make sense to anybody else, but we were just making the videos because we like to make them, you know? So like, because, because we had like, it, it wasn't just trying to make it and show it to anyone else. It was like, we made it now we can watch it ourselves and it's funny to us. Okay. So there's so, a nice kind of appreciation for it straight away. And yeah, when you, when you guys things were... make absolutely no sense, even to this day, I look at something and I'm like, what were we thinking there? <laughs> I can't remember exactly what we were trying to do. And when you say that you guys work together, would you be kind of writing them together or animating or, or, or both? Uh, all the ideas we come up with together and then all of the animation and editing I do. Uh, okay, brilliant. That's just always how it's been, I guess. I just I just took to the animation side of things. So mm -hmm. you started off Benny and Lee and was it a case of with the first episode, did you kind of know you were going to make more or was it a case of like, put it out there, see how it goes, but maybe we'll try something else. I think we always knew that we'd, as long as we were brick filling, we'd keep the series going because that was just what everyone else did. You know, like all the brick fillers we looked up to were, they just had a series that, you know, if a contest comes along like Tech or whatever, and, and they need some stock characters and a set already built, they just make another, let's say, Ben and Andy for Tech. So, it just seemed like the kind of, I mean, you know, there's not much thought really put into it when you're that young. You're just doing things just for the sake of it. But it, it's it's like everyone had this kind of thing in the background that they could, they could make another one at any time. Uh, so yeah. Okay, brilliant. Just like that basically. And it just we, weren't, kind of we were never never concerned about YouTube views or, you know, popularity or anything. It was just I think you just want to make whatever you want to make. Yeah, that's it's a it's very interesting you mentioned that because I think there is unfortunately there's kind of like a I know it's very easy to say oh that's a bad way to approach it that you should but I feel like you know particularly with brick filming because it is such a slow process you know what I mean you're mm -hmm. you're, you're literally animating frame by frame I think to, yeah. to be trying to predict what's going to be popular is a kind of a, a dangerous rabbit hole to fall down because you end up being very disappointed with something you've made oh yeah purely based on how many people have seen it whereas like uh as far as i've ever seen it's kind of in the lap of the gods what what does yeah. well and what doesn't like you said some of your test footage was kind of more popular and you're like how do you explain that yeah and um but i mean i don't mind if people want to make videos that are geared towards getting views but as long as they understand that it it's a bad they, they're trying to do brick filming for views it's not a very good idea you know if you really want views you should be doing something else if you want to make a brick film and you think you have an idea that, that you're, you're gearing it towards getting views, then yeah, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, but don't expect it to, you know, go any further than it's going to basically. I think that's good advice because exactly like you said, if you're in it for views, I think there are far less time consuming things you could do to put sure. content out there. I think it, there has, has to be a bit of a passion project uh, because it, it takes so long from start to finish. Um, and I suppose then to kind of get back to the, the, Fast forward to Benny and Lee Parallel Panic. Where did the the idea for this um, short come from? By that point, we started making it in 2014. And by that point, Benny and Lee had been around for a good few years. And, you know, there was loads and loads of installments. Most of them are made in like 08 and 09. But I think I was starting to feel like we had made so many installments, but, and they had a lot, you know, a lot of the times there was funny little bits in them, but they were kind of rough and, you know, very slow, poorly edited and poor sound design. <laughs> and I think by that point, I was kind of feeling like um, we need to make a Benny and Lee film that it will stand up. Like 
it will stand above all the others. It's like that's a really a really good one. R- rather than it just being sort of like this this series as a whole that's been running for a long time and has some interesting parts. I'd like I would have liked for there to be a specific film that he would point to as like, oh, that's a you know a, a good film with Benny and Lee. <laughs> I like to think that that we accomplished that. But um, I was going to say we were also inspired by the Biff and Mario films, the Taco Trouble in particular, which were much longer than you know most other big films at the time, and they were more adventurous. Like they had, they weren't exactly dynamic duo films like what everyone else made because they were they started before the whole duo trend. But the, even though they had two characters, uh, the the you know the adventures they went on were greater than the other duo films he've made. So we wanted to make a longer and more adventurous Benny and Lee film okay. With, within the confines of their one room. We always like to keep this idea that we're stretching, like how far can you take a series and keep it all in one room? And sort of the idea behind Parallel Panic was we can keep it all in one room if it's parallel universes and every parallel universe is the same room, basically. Okay, brilliant. It's so interesting to hear where the kind of genesis of that came from, because I was going to say there is a there's a very distinctive, you know, like an old sitcom type set where you're only seeing the one direction and the characters come in and out, but Mm. they are in that room. So uh, that's very interesting to hear kind of a creative way around that. But I think that that, it just kind of originated, you know, essentially just from laziness, like starting out, they'd all be in one room because we weren't bothered building any other sets. But eventually people started to comment on that because we'd made so many films people started to say like oh i can't believe you're you're still managing to get more material and it's all just in the one room that is very impressive you're kind of thinking "Hmm, that is interesting maybe we should like strictly adhere to that and and push it as far as it can go yeah i think to try and keep something in the same set obviously has its advantages because your your set is constantly there you're ready to go but it also must have its storytelling sort of setbacks in terms of I'm sure sometimes you come up with ideas and you're like oh no that's outside we want to kind of keep it in here so it's uh mm-hmm. it's kind of pros and cons and yeah. can I ask do you when it comes to something like this or your brick films in general but specifically with Parallel Panic do you script or storyboard at all? Vinny and Lee has always been completely made up as we go along <laughs> okay Probably well. because we just started that way by being kids you know but then once it starts running for so long you kind of want to keep making it in the same manner so that it's like you know similar you don't want we never liked the idea of the series becoming like super well made or anything you know you kind of betray the the series in general i guess you want so to keep these, it consistent kind of yeah if any of these never had any written script at all I, I guess something that we like to keep in mind is if we forget an idea, it must have meant that it wasn't good enough. <laughs> okay, that's a good... Like if something's uh, really, really funny, we're going to remember it. <laughs> that's a good process to go by. And was that the same for Parallel Panic? So even those 15 minutes, did you guys just kind of have a general outline in terms of we know, you know, X and Y is going to happen, but mm-hmm. exactly how it's going to work, we're just going to explore as we animate? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I can't remember exactly. But I think we must have had the idea that there's going to be like the evil universe where the couch ends up and you know there, there must be some sort of climactic scene at the end okay. with the evil characters but yeah specifics it was all just on the fly basically and can i ask i suppose just to before we get into the actual kind of filming and stuff like that for this film for parallel panic what kind of a camera or, or software are you using so we will basically for many years we never used animation software. Um, I think for no other reason other than just that that's how I started and I was kind of set in my ways, I guess. Like once yeah. you get used to doing something one way, it's kind of hard to change. Uh, and the camera was the Logitech C920. And um, before that, you know, it was the Logitech Pro 5000, which was a really bad choice for multiple reasons. At the time in the community, everyone used the Pro 4000, which was a good camera for rig filming but by the time I came along the 4000 was out of production and the 5000 was in the shops and it, it looked pretty much exactly the same so I bought the 5000 but it had all of these changes that made it less suited to rig filming I upgraded from the 5000 to the C920 which of course I think we all know is is good for rig filming the, you know I, I just take the the photos with the Logitech software and they just save into a folder and then later on I just put them into either monkey jam or virtual dub and then just save all the frames as a video file but you know so basically i was animating blind in that like 
I couldn't flip back and forth between the frames and I was just hoping it was going to go well. God, um, that's, like, that's quite a leap. Was that tough sometimes? Like, did you get footage back sometimes when you put it in and be like, oh, you know, something's happened there and I'll have to reshoot or I'll just, you know, I'll stick with it. That must have been quite a process. Well, I mean, I, I would open up the folder and open up the individual frames and like flip back and forth in Windows Photo Viewer if I needed to, you know, as kind of an annoying process i guess but if i really wanted to see how something was coming along or it, see if if somebody moved in the last frame and you know if i'd forgotten to move them in this this frame especially the crowd scenes in parallel panic were extremely annoying you know trying to see who's moved and who hasn't and a lot of that at the end of the film a lot of the time i'm trying to hide the crowd trying to keep them off screen because it was so difficult to animate them all with no software and like i think by the end of that i was thinking to myself i, I must never make a break film with a crowd ever again <laughs> But of it course, starts. in Tiger Turtle 2, in Tiger Turtle 2, there's a much bigger crowd and it's much more, it's much easier to animate a crowd when you have dragon frame and you can just flip back and forth and see who who's moved and who hasn't yeah, and how, how it's all going. But, you know, timing the dialogue is very difficult as well with no, without being able to import the line and, you know, see it on the timeline. See it and I was just going to ask, because obviously then if you're doing that blind, it kind of, and can I ask when you were taking the, the photos, what uh, frame rate were you playing them back at then? For the longest time, the Benny and Lee films were 16 frames per second because they started okay. off in Windows Movie Maker and the, the the best Movie Maker could do was eight frames per second. But then once you saved that as a video file, you could import it again and double the speed. So you would okay, achieve wow. 16 frames per so second. That's a little uh, hack. Because I was going to say, yeah, 16 is a very unusual frame rate. Yeah, it's very odd. But that, that's the only reason why it was ever 16. It's just because of the limitations of Movie Maker. But I, but by the time we were doing Parallel Panic, we were using Vegas, and I think Parallel Panic is fifteen frames per second. Okay, uh, fifteen. But we we'd time the dialogue basically just by opening the lines in Audacity, and I I'd look and see, you know, oh, this this is occurring at like half a second in, and you know, then I see what words are popping up at like each second, half second, quarter second interval, and just kind of wing it. Like I have a general idea of how many frames I need to take to get to a certain point. In that, sorry, in that, in that sense, with the dialogue, are you like recording that in advance as like rough or are you recording the finished thing and then kind of listening to it and exactly like you said, timing it out? Like, is that done all in advance or are they just kind of you roughly kind of doing scratch tracks for characters? No, we'd, we'd always record the, the finished dialogue first. I mean, I think that, you know, it's what it, basically everyone learns to do in stop motion. You have to have the, the audio so you can try and time it as best as you can. But of course, by the time, you know, we got to using Dragon Frame for Tiger Trouble 2, we can time the dialogue so much better, you know, down to the individual syllables that people are saying. Yeah, so, it's a great, yeah. uh, I only really discovered that recently because uh, I've been using Dragon Frame for a while now. And yeah, almost exactly like you said, you kind of get used to doing things a certain way and you kind of never sort of like deviate from your path because you're like, no, I know this works. And I'll keep mm -hmm. kind of trundling along. But uh yeah, I, I only realized recently that you can kind of drop that in and, and sync it up. And it's it's an amazing tool to get to be able to kind of go, oh, that lasts exactly, you know, 12 frames. So I need to make mm -hmm. that kind of movement last that long. OK. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I love the look of animation, dialogue animation that's really, you know, intertwined with the line so that they're moving on, moving to how the line is delivered. And, you know, on, on each syllable, on each emphasis. I love that. You know, in, in our older films, it was not like that they just do a, a lazy arm raise or lean forward or something's very boring and not very engaging but then over time we've gotten more into trying to make the dialogue animation more engaging and, and they the way they move looks like how the line sounds <laughs> that's brilliant yeah I, and that was actually one of the the things i was going to ask you was timing that out because definitely the movements seemed to take a huge leap is one of the things i noticed from your earlier episodes to here and that was a conscious thing was it because oh, yeah. you kind of wanted the, the the sync of the dialogue with the movement. Yeah, I think by that point, I was looking back on my old films and thinking, oh my God, it's so bad. <laughs> All these movements are so lazy and poorly animated and poorly timed. So yeah, I was kind of think, thinking that we need to make a conscious effort to step up the animation. And I, I was actually kind of afraid. I remember at the very start, in, in starting Parallel Panic, I knew it was going to take a long time. And I knew that I was going to improve as an animator in you know, in making a conscious effort to do so. So I was kind of thinking to myself, oh no, what if the first few scenes I animate, by the time I've finished the film, they're going to look really bad and they're 
they're not going to slot into the film very well. The but, end ones will look great, but the start, yeah, because yeah. it's like, but okay. I, I think that it, I think it worked out because I was because I started off thinking that it has to be better animated than the older ones. I think the film all you know slots together. It's it all kind of looks consistent. Yeah, there's some. I I kind of had picked out um, a couple of uh, sort of bits that I'd noticed just specifically digging into Parallel Panic. Um, and I suppose just to start with, one of the things that like I had a question on, um, sort of separate to the animation itself, was the music. Do you kind of source that from anywhere in particular, or do you do you make it, or or where do you get your your music from? I guess with Parallel Panic, that was another another thing that was playing into it being sort of like the the big Vinny and Lee film, the, the one that will stand out is that we wanted it to have an original soundtrack. Uh, you know, it seemed like major brick film projects like the Henri and Edmund films, uh, you know, the original soundtracks really help to elevate them a- above just average brick films. You know, before that, we used a lot of music from video games. And then, but then we started just sourcing the music from like, royalty free music websites because you know for a while I for a while I was making some money from YouTube advertising in like the late 2010s I mean in the late 2000s early 2010s so I was trying to keep everything royalty free but then after a while we just it's more fun to source the music from things that you like you know video game music that you like and just I just much prefer to put in music and I, I enjoy searching for good music that I like that'll fit really well I prefer that over being able to monetize the videos. For this short with the music, did you did you say you got this scored specifically? And was that um, a YouTuber or was that just someone you knew? Or that was, The music was by Blue Ghost, has been a community member for about as long as I have. And okay, cool. uh, he also does the voiceovers in my history videos and just random voices in pretty much every film I make. Yeah, I guess we wanted an original soundtrack because I guess the, the tier kind of goes like at the bottom is royalty free music and then better than that is just stealing music and better than that is original music that you know is like timed and ties in with the actions and everything so to to, to make the film seem like on a higher level than the other Benny and Lee's and yeah something we wanted was an original soundtrack so and Blue Ghost he, he actually I think he only made the soundtrack in like less than a month because wow. You know, I, I wanted to submit the film to the, the VFG Awards. By the time I was finished animating it, it was near the, near the end of 2016. So I was kind of saying to him, oh, you know, do you think you can get this done by the end of 2016 so I can submit it? But, and he managed to do that, you know, really, really quickly. So I was really, That's pretty really impressive, that. especially for a 15 minute. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there was a, a conversation where I was like, yeah, sure, send it on. How long is it? You know, thinking <laughs> two, three minutes like the other episodes. Like, no, it's actually 15 minutes. You're like, whoa, OK. Uh, yeah. But that's brilliant Um, because like you said, it does, whether you kind of notice it or not at the time that you're listening to an original score, I think when someone draws your attention to it, you're like, oh, that's why that scene felt, you know, whether it's like a a lighthearted comedy moment, there just isn't the same when you're trying to wedge a piece of music into your film. You know, I'm guilty of using that record scratch too much, you know, when you want something to just stop or allow it smash to fade it because it just it'll yeah. never time out perfectly it just doesn't time correctly yeah exactly so i suppose moving on i was asking and i know you kind of talked about this earlier so your movement in this thing is definitely you know something you've improved on uh there's a couple of examples i'm going to kind of highlight out on just in terms of things that really stood out to me was that something you kind of practiced beforehand or did you just say you know i'm just going to make a conscious effort as i'm filming i feel like a lot of improvement that I, I've done, it's all conscious effort. Like as soon as you notice something and start thinking about it, then you can't go back. <laughs> so it's it was the same, like Parallel Panic, it's not, it's not photographed very interestingly, you know, it's all just basic, like point the webcam at what's happening. So by the time we were making Taco Trouble 2, that was when it was like, okay, now we have to make a conscious effort to actually have better camera angles, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so yeah, it, it just kind of comes about as like realizing what you could improve on and then actually trying. So I guess it doesn't require much, much practice. It's more just like knowing before you attack it, what the approach should be. And it, do you ever find that when you're doing say a film that long, a 15 minute one, do you find that you do a scene and play it back and would you ever reshoot it all? Or is it kind of like, you know, this is just how it's evolved. Uh, I definitely do not like reshooting animation. (laughs) 
it's kind uh, of soul you know, destroying isn't it because you're like yeah it's just kind of the worst feeling in the world to have gone through all this effort and just think i have to throw it out now and do it again so no uh, okay. I, i'm willing to just accept some i mean i guess i just try and get it right the first time like you know if it's looking bad then i might delete a few frames and go back to a certain point and but sometimes there is the the temptation like sometimes you're trying to animate something and the figure keeps falling over and you're getting really frustrated and you're just there's the temptation to delete every single frame that you've taken in the shot and just say that was you know it wasn't working it was, it was a failure of <laughs> we'll an start attempt. again yeah call it for but, today but if you push through eventually you know some of the shots in taco trouble 2 were like that i was thinking at the start oh this is this is not going to work the setup isn't going to work the animation isn't going to work it's but you know and after about like 40 frames i'm thinking oh it's so bad like i'm not going to get through this but then eventually just push through is that just a kind of a like a, a, a willpower thing or do you think it's also like maybe a, a, an acceptance for like okay it doesn't have to be perfect like is the perfectionist perfectionist in you kind of having to be silenced a little bit to get through the shot or is it a kind of a how do you approach something like that well yeah it's like the reason why i'd want to scrap it is because it's not looking perfect but then i'm just thinking well i guess i just have to you know put the effort and time in to make it look perfect from here okay <laughs> rather and than just give up give up and I suppose, like you, like we said when you go back to the start there is it's kind of for me it's double the pressure then you know you're like oh, okay I've gotten it wrong the first time I really have to make sure I get it right now and you lose the fun for the scene then I think if you have to go yeah, through it so. it's not like live action where you can just say take two and you know <laughs> start straight away and for for this film what kind of a uh, lighting equipment do you use well parallel panic was all just like two lamps it's just kind of whatever lamps we had around in the house uh, just Perfect. pointed at the set i mean there's no real interesting lighting setup for parallel panic except for sometimes we're shining a torch in little gaps or you know behind like the parallel of order in the evil of the universe has a torch coming down from above so there was a you know a hole to shine the torch through but you know later on for making taco trouble 2 is when we stepped up our lighting setup and had multiple lights and you know different high powered bulbs and colored lights okay, and well and you're going so for like, like a kind of a look whereas with yeah. parallel panic you just kind of wanted like even light you wanted to be able to see things well, well with parallel panic it was more just like we weren't thinking about it yet we were still yeah. in the 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 old mode of just it has to be lit up just point a light at it and as long as you can see everything then you're good to go you know that was some of the leftover like stuck in our ways from just how we did it as kids you know and in fairness, there is a, a, I suppose, with Parallel Panic, it's a consistency, it's, it's a series, so you're kind of wanting mm -hmm. to keep, I think if the that look of it suddenly work, changed yeah. all of a sudden and it's, you know, Godfather lit, you'd be like, mm -hmm. hmm, is this the same series or, or what is this? It's definitely a, yeah. a, a bit of a I branch. We do have that kind of, a, I guess you could call it an excuse to fall back on anything, you know, we, we could say, oh, we don't want Benny and Lee to suddenly become, you know, super well lit and shot it's, it's yeah, supposed to be yeah, it's, it's trying to keep it consistent so you don't like you know outdate the other ones too much and i suppose mm -hmm. i marked out a couple of just for anyone who's kind of watching through it there was a couple of like time codes that really stood out to me so um i'll just kind of describe them it was at two minutes 22 seconds so it's as benny throws his kind of clone version of himself uh off the couch uh and, and onto the ground the camera kind of moves with the throw and then back uh, and, and it looks really really slick did you did you have to practice this or or did you kind of just go for it that was all just yeah just going for it basically freehand there was the c920 on the base plate and you know just kind of trying as best as i can to move it consistently uh and that's a you know a great advantage of the webcam is that you can move it around like that uh, it's kind of something i've been missing now now that i'm using a dslr it's very, very difficult to do moving camera shots. And like, I, I kind of want to experiment with a webcam again. If I make another major project, I'd like to mix and match between webcam and DSLR, depending on what suits best. Because I like, you know, rewatching Parallel Panic just now, I like how the camera feels like it's really in the room because of course it actually is. Uh, and, but the downside is because Benny Lee is shot on a base plate, I feel like the camera is too high for pretty much the whole film. Like it, it's just slightly get looking there, down it. on everyone, just yeah. a little bit. I didn't really notice it when I was making it because I was just used to working at webcams. But now after having the freedom from using a DSLR and I can have low angle shots. And and in, in making Taco Trouble 2, I you know built the set with built the set on stilts so that I could pull out chunks of the floor and have you know sink the camera lower into the floor. And that's 
looking at Parallel Panic now, I'm thinking, oh, if I could do this again, I'd, I'd love to be able to sink the camera down lower. But of course, no. you, because the set was built on a base plate to begin with, it ca can't just rip out a piece of the base plate to yeah. lower the camera. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Because yeah, I haven't, uh, I've no experience using a webcam, but anyone I've heard talking about it is the major advantage is, you know, it's almost like having a steady cam in live action. You can get right in beside a character in the set. Whereas I think mm. what you gain in quality with a DSLR you lose that kind of like um, fluidity and being able to get in close to things because you almost have to build your sets around your DSLR. Whereas I guess with a webcam, you can kind of go, here's the set, like just, you know, plonk the camera in there and away you go. And I think you can just, you can just kind of feel when a camera is further away from a subject, even if you, you don't consciously notice it, it just has a different feel, you know, watching a webcam film. It, it, I guess it, a webcam, it's kind of weird to say, because, you know, obviously with DSLRs, you're using like actual lenses and stuff. So you'd think it would be more like an actual film. But the webcam feel and the way it can like follow characters closely, sometimes it feels more like a real film in the, the way it's shot and how close the camera is to the characters. So I'd certainly like to bring some of that back. Go oh, kind of maybe experiment with that and try and find like a, a sort of a, an in-between almost. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, like cool. If you look at Forest Fire's Mandalorian film and the, the camera is moving with the figure in the set, like in the really tightly packed set. And it's really close to everybody. You know, it, it feels a lot like a, an actual film. Okay. Yeah. And for the, you kind of said, um, you touched on this earlier with the, uh, I suppose, the, the, the portal effect. What kind of, uh, did, was there any kind of post-production elements to that? I know you were saying you had to kind of torch over it, but how did you achieve that, uh, that kind of portal disappearing uh, effect? Well, when, the, when they go in and out of the, the portal yeah it's it's all just like basic i mean I, i'd cut out the characters using gimp and and they'd have they'd be on a transparent background then and i just take that element into vegas and just kind of frame by frame move it around and shrink it and you know add a like add trails this was since then i've kind of discovered you know how to actually animate things in vegas but back then, I didn't really know anything about that. So I was just doing it all frame by frame. Okay, cool. And um, with that kind of shot, like from start to finish, would that take a long time? Or was that a, a like a relatively simple process? Well, each effect like that, they, they go in and out very quickly. So there weren't too many frames. And of course, you know, making things occur in a quick movement, you can kind of hide any inconsistencies. Yeah, so that was the benefit of that. Okay, brilliant. But I like to keep as much of it in camera as possible. Like, you know, some of the portal effects at the end, I just, you know, you're shining the light in the evil universe to do the portal effect. Basically, I just flare out the the light in camera. I just point it at the camera lens. And then then once it's gone, you can see the figures. They've now appeared. Oh, brilliant. Okay. I just like all that, uh, doing stuff with real lights and things. In cameras, there, it feels more tangible. And I suppose yeah. you have the benefit of being able to see it's working kind of in, in the moment as opposed to kind of going, well, I hope that works in editing. Yeah. We'll see. But, uh, and there's a cool, I suppose, after, as we kind of move through the film, there's a really nice tracking shot. When it comes to like following with the character, are you shooting on a webcam? Are you moving the, the webcam with the character or is the set moving and, and the camera's steady? Any camera movement like that in Parallel Panic was all done by building a, a Lego housing around the camera and then putting that on a track of Lego tiles. Uh, oh, wow. and the Lego okay. tiles would have bricks on either side to keep the like camera train tracks based. almost keep it in. Yeah, keep it steady so you could just slide it left and right or front and back. It was just it, it wasn't measured or anything. It was just, you know, basically we each frame just tried to get as small an increment as humanly possible. And if you always aim for the same sm as small as humanly possible, then it's going to be consistent, basically. Okay. Or consistent enough. <laughs> Nice. Well, it also takes a good bit of feeling for it, though, doesn't it? Because there's nothing worse yeah. when you think you've been moving at gradual paces and you play it back and it's like, whoop, whoop, mm -hmm. whoop. And you're yeah. like, oh, OK, yeah, that's the effect we're going for. A handheld but kind of thing. By now, I've learned about a stabilizer in well, Vegas has stabilizer, but it's not as good as premieres. So in Tiger Trouble 2, the camera movements like that, yeah, the, the best thing to do is try to get them as good as possible to begin with but then just put a tiny little stabilizer on in Premiere and it, it just smooths out the, any of the larger inconsistencies. And it, I think it oh, looks brilliant. pretty good. I didn't know that. I, I use uh, 
Final Cut Pro for my editing, just because it's it's you know like most things, it's what I got with the uh, the computer I got at the time, and ever since then I've just been using that. But uh, I must look into a kind of a a, a stabilizer thing because I've never uh, I've never experimented with that, and it sounds like it could uh, save a lot of headaches for future it projects, does. especially if if you're animating a camera movement and then one frame suddenly looks bad, and you're thinking, oh, I can't go back now because I've already moved all the figures, etc. You just think you can think to yourself, okay. Once I put the stabilizer on, it'll just smooth out that one bad part. So okay, brilliant. It really takes away that, element, that feeling of, oh, I've ruined the whole shot. Yeah, because for me, and I'm sure it's similar for you, what, that one bad shot is all I see then. When I'm watching yeah, that yeah. movie, I'm like, oh, here the film, comes yeah. the terrible shot. And probably a lot of people just bypass it, but you're like, yeah. no, I can't use it. Uh, <laughs> and of course, I much prefer real camera movements over digital camera movements. Yeah. You know, it always looks different when, as the camera moves, you know sort of the like the way everything in relation to the how far it is away from the camera and things get uncovered and covered up it's a yeah. lot different than digital camera movements but if it's a, a major tracking shot or you know pushing in for a long time then I, I i can always tell and i always think oh it doesn't look as good as if it was real as if you've done it in like physically yeah and do you have a uh for the i suppose the benny and lee film specifically do you have a specific room that you film these in like is it like a, a spare room or a shed or something or is it just always set up in one place or do you move it around it's always been in the living room uh, for, for the benny and lee films it's just a very very small tabletop beside the computer uh for the longest time we were just using a, a tiny tiny setup for animation which of course i guess is part of why benny and lee is always taking place in the one room because the one small just, set yeah yeah it's kind of limited. The, the lego base plate is on the table and that's about the entire that's about all the space we have, you know, or we had at the time. Okay. But since then, we've installed a bigger table. We had to. Okay. Um, set. Would you, is that a, is there a window in that room that you have to black out or do you kind of film at night or how do you do it? Well, yeah, there is a window. I, I would, you know, have to close the curtains if, if I'm filming at the day in daytime, but it's kind of a dark room to begin with. And also okay. I do kind of prefer animating at night. A lot of the shots in Tiger Trouble 2, I keep mentioning it. I feel like I'm name dropping this film too often. But... No, it's great for like, I think the more reference people have, uh, and that's the whole point of this is to kind of, I suppose, specifically talk about something so that people can go away and, and see these examples that you're talking about. Like, oh, that's, you know, like he's explained that shot and now I can see how it actually panned out. Yeah, but a lot of the shots were done overnight. Uh, I, okay. I, just, I don't know why I just prefer, I mean, it's really quiet and dark and it's just, you know, nothing going on. You can just focus on the animation. And would you animate? And of, and for, of course, it's dark. That helps. And it's too. dark. Yeah, yeah. Natural darkness is the best blackout <laughs> curtains you can get. Yeah. Uh, and would you animate for like long stretches at a time? Like, would you prefer to kind of, you know, that you're saying animate it at night? Would you go like for a good few hours in a row, or would you just kind of do two or three hours? Or how does it normally work? As long as the shot takes. As long. Okay. Wow. So that's that's dedication. So you're there until yeah. you get that shot done. That's right. Yeah. Because if you if you take a break and come back something has changed you know you might yeah. think that nothing could possibly affect the where the positions of the lights are or the position of the camera but for some reason you turn it on again after a few hours break and everything looks just slightly different once i start i'm locked in have to go even if it's 18 hours really? one of the 18, shots is 18 hours yeah 18 hours really i mean i'm kind of slow i guess i i, I maybe i'd be taking too many minor breaks but no, absolutely. Opening, I mean, the tracking I think that's very impressive. Too, tracking across the crowd and all, you know, there's like 25-ish figures moving. Uh, yeah, that took a long time. It's like a 21-second shot. Jeez, okay. Well, that's dedication, though. I think uh, 18 hours I'd be on the floor, probably passed <laughs> out. But uh, I know what you mean. I think the coming back to a um, a shot in the middle of it, I think I've done that before, and I've had to do an impromptu camera angle change that's normally because sometimes people are like, oh, that's an interesting camera angle. And I'm like, well, that's because I came back to that shot halfway through and it looked completely different, even though I had touched nothing. Uh, yeah. So well, there, there were one or two shots where I did them over two days. Uh, and, you know, the, ca yeah, the camera angle might slightly be different by the time you come back to it. But then I just readjust it in in editing later. Just try and make the match just as close as possible. And, you know. You can make it work. You can fix it to the best of your abilities, and then you can't really tell in the final. Okay, film. but your preference is always to, if you can, get that shot done, even if it is a yeah. long shot. Start it and then kind of finish it in the one go. 
Oh, that yeah, makes sense. Reference, yeah. And then I suppose in the parallel panic film, there's another thing I noticed at there's about the three minute, 16 second mark. There's a really nice uh, suspended in midair gag. This was the, um, I think, goes to uh, Lee is coming out and he goes to sit on the couch. that's not there. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's yeah. kind of like a really nice, remind me of an old like uh, Warner Brothers cartoon because it's like that. And then he just falls through. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, how yeah, did you yeah. uh, do that? Shot? Holds, holds at the top for a few frames. Yeah, so yeah. He was actually sitting on a like a clear bracket piece, a Lego piece. Uh, but I like to use clear pieces for masking because you know the the light can come through, uh, and it, it's easier if it's, if it's not a different color against them. You know you can you can erase it very easily. Uh, oh, okay, and it's not, it's not it's not casting any color reflection of its own. So yeah, he's just sitting on a clear piece and then then just falls off, and you know it's it, yeah it's basically just masking and maybe maybe painting in using the clone tool. Uh, if there's anything that needs to be, you know, covered over. Just okay, to, just to kind of hide yeah, it a bit. Back in. But that's very interesting, you said, with the, the clear plastic. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I never actually thought to use them because I think when I started out, I just was using kind of any color brick. Yeah. But, you know, when you, you have to be incredibly accurate because if you're cutting it out and, you know, you've, like you said, you're getting a bit of like pink reflection on their clothes yeah. or, or you cut not enough and you can see this weird like outline around the leg or wherever the point at which two colors clash and they kind of blend together and then you have to erase too much to get rid of the other color you know okay so you're, that was you're chipping was, in yeah that was the problem i was coming up against that's that's what the clear plastic managed to fix okay brilliant no that's a great tip because uh yeah i think i eventually ended up buying like you know like a, a wallace and gromit like armature like literally just mm -hmm. the kind of ball and socket thing so yeah. my theory thinking was that it would be the you know least amount of contact with it but again, it's not very sturdy because I end up having to like blue tack it to the back. Um, yeah, and they the start clear. leaning. Yeah, off the blue tack. <laughs> you get this like like was he meant to do that? And you kind of go, well, okay, let's just you know let's just make that part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And another thing that I loved, and it's really nice that you mentioned Wallace and Gromit kind of at the top of this as a as a reference. There's a really a good shot that uh, sort of straight away I thought Wallace and Gromit. It's at about five thirty two. It's the extendable arm coming out of the couch, uh, you know, to kind of pour tea and stuff like that. And, and that, yeah. that was a beautiful shot. Was that something that, did that take a lot of effort or can you talk us through kind of how that was, that shot was set up? It was all pretty rough. The, the arm pieces are just kind of blue tacked, you know, wherever you can hide the, the blue tack. And then I think when it starts to come in and go out, they were just stuck on like a, you know, a Lego trolley basically. Oh, like brilliant. So you could kind of yank back it back. Off. Brilliant. Yeah. And, and I feel the, like the liquid, was, what was the liquid? Oh, the liquid was just clear plastic colored with a like coloring marker. Wow. To, you know, make it a bit more tea like. And then the milk was just paper, of course. But I think that those arm sequences might have been subconsciously inspired by Dr. Jobs, an old brick film that I watched again recently. And it has all these arms coming in to make his breakfast. And I'm looking at those. You know, especially because it did Lego, I was thinking, hmm, that's very much, that's very similar to what I did in Parallel yeah. And I know I would have seen that years ago. So it was in probably there. It was a... But also it's kind of Wallace and Gromit esque with the whole machines. Yeah. That's the thing. Them. And exactly like you said, making breakfast. That just reminded, especially the tea. I just straight yeah. away, I was like, oh, that's such a nice kind of like reference. And uh, in fairness, for me, it's those little things that turn a, a kind of a, a, an entertaining brick film into something that you're like, oh, this is kind of setting a benchmark. Because, you know, very easy just to have, you know, pour, hand over a cup of tea and you're like, yeah, great. There's mugs, it's ready to go. But to actually get to see it spilling in, I'd say, and, and like the scale of that, I'd say, was so small that that was probably a, a, a tough shot to do for how, like, few seconds it's on the screen. But uh, yeah. very I'd say that was probably inspired by acquiring that giant Lego teapot. We just thought that was so funny that we should use it. <laughs> We have to we have to use that in there somewhere and you were saying earlier just with the 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 voices you record all your finished dialogue in advance because i've spoken to some animators who just do rough you know scratch tracks themselves and then get the animators to come in later but for a parallel panic you had all the voices done in advance did you well i mean you know we'd probably just record shortly before creating the animation we didn't do them all in one big block i mean because we didn't even have the uh, the script figured out at the start or anything so it's kind of as, but, you, yeah. as you went along yes yeah, so, well we have to make this shot next so the first thing we have to do is record the lines and then we'll animate it 
Okay, perfect. And how, how many uh, voice actors did you use in this? I would, well, my brother and I are all of the Vennies in these, and uh, Blue Ghost, who did the music, has a small role as one of the Skellies. Then there's also um, the, like, girl universe. Then. Yeah. That, that's, that's kind of like a, there's a few in-jokes in there, basically. Um, Dew Films was a, like, voice actress in Brick Filming for... In sort of in the brickfilms.com era, it was like, you know, if there's a female character in a brick film, it, it's going to be voiced by Jew films. You know, okay. kind of a, a sort of known trend. I mean, then it kind of changed, you know, then, oh, oh now, now if there's a female character in a brick film, it's going to be voiced by Sparks Flying, who, of course, is the sole female character who appeared in Benny and Me before Parallel Panic. But yeah, and then, of course, part of the joke in that universe is that the other female characters are just voiced by men doing, you know, High pitched voices. Yeah. It was kind of a bit of a you know reference to yeah how female voice acting has worked in brick filming. Um and for the all the different um sort of characters had all kind of different variations on the couches. Is that something that you sat down? Because I always think I have so much respect for people who can design things out of Lego. A lot of the time when I'm kind of making a brick film, I'm definitely using the characters and vehicles in Lego, but sometimes I'm kind of making the sets out of more arts and crafts, you know, polystyrene type things. Mm -hmm. But is the couches something that you guys had to sit down beforehand and say, okay, this is going to be the couch of that realm or, or how did that work? Well, I think the first thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, you mentioned how, oh, you just using arts and crafts for the sets, but I guess a lot of us brick filmers would look at that and think, oh, that's so cool. It's so different. <laughs> it's <laughs> you know, funny, isn't it? it you're and always you're kind of, those. you're yeah, looking at you're someone else's going. Someone yeah. else is doing, yeah. The couches you know, I never really considered myself to be like a great like Lego designer. I mean, I guess I, I made a, a conscious effort with Sacred Triple Two recently, but before that, it was just, you know, you just throw together whatever you need. I guess I was trying a little bit harder, but I guess with Parallel Panic was like the first brick film I actually ordered pieces on Bricklink to make. So we had some idea in mind before. Okay. To design that, that's when you know you've gone up a level when you're ordering specific <laughs> pieces. You're yeah, like, okay, exactly, you're, yeah. it's coming up a level. In the, the when they go to the, the universe where Alex and Derek live in their house. Of course, those, you know, the couch there is from the Alex and Derek films. Okay. And, and then the, the, the small green couch is from the older Alex and Derek films. It's kind of making fun of it looking weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, there's some really nice, I think uh, I'm so jealous of all the different uh, kind of variations on the sets that you made. Because like you said, for me, the one of the biggest things I was marveling at was how you've, you know, essentially use the same set over and over again but manage to make it feel, you know, uh, completely different, but also give it kind of nice personality twerks, you know, different uh, tweaks and things to it. So, no, I thought that was really nice. Uh, you know, in the older Benny and Lisa's, there's, there's points at which characters are just walking and they, they're shuffling around and sitting on chairs and go, they have to go from one place to the other. But with Parallel Panic, we were trying to cut time a lot and cut the dead zones. Okay. Uh, so that's, at certain points, you know, there'll be a cut where the characters are now suddenly moved to somewhere else or... If they have to walk somewhere, they'll just like zoom, they just zip, you know, from one place to the other, uh, rather than like just taking their time to go each step. Yeah. I much prefer for them to just fly to where they need to be. And, you know, it's well, it's nice because it's kind of a cartoony film, so it fits. But uh, I think my favorite part in, in the part that looked the best as far as it wouldn't have been like how we would have done it years ago is when the evil Lee is opening and closing the door and he, he's just kind of like flying around on the studs. Like he has to open the door and he, he gets from one place to the other. He's not like locked into the, the row of studs. You know what I mean? He glides over them to get. It's to a really nice, be. like you said, it really ties into that cartoony effect. And, and even the, I, I kind of think the, it really sort of ties into the wackiness of just the tone of Benny and Lee, the fact that they're in one place and next thing it's there. You know what I mean? It is very like, and like you said, you want a, a conscious effort to cut out of oh, this is just a character walking because yeah. that's when your mind kind of slows down and goes, you know, there's there's not much story to be gained from just seeing a character walk. Yeah. Um, it's the kind of thing that when you're young, you 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 don't think about it. You just think, oh, well, he has to get from here to here. Yeah. But then by the, by the point of when we were making that film, we were looking back at our old films and thinking, God, this this part is so boring. They're just walking. Yeah. You know, there's nothing <laughs> it's going funny, on. It's funny, isn't it? Because probably back then you were like, I'm so proud of that walk cycle. Look at that guy. <laughs> walk. 
there's yeah, there's a couple of shots in the old Vin Diesel where it's like, oh, there's three figures walking all at once, you know, like, in one man. shot for, for ages. Wow, yeah. <laughs> look at all the look at all this effort I put in to make them walk. And now I'm thinking, oh, you should have just deleted that whole shot. <laughs> yeah, that's funny, isn't it? It's like as you go, yeah. as you get kind of more comfortable with animating, I think you kind of focus more on the story and what you can mm-hmm. get out of it. Uh, and you kind of mentioned this earlier, but how difficult was that crowd scene to film in uh, in Parallel Panic? Yeah, well, I mean, as I was saying. The, the great difficulty was because of not using software and not being able to easily tell who has to move and who who has already moved. But my best tip for animating crowds is certainly to move each figure in order, each frame. You know, okay, so start like on the left, move that person yeah, a little bit and go row exactly, by, like yeah. person by person. Okay, I can't believe that you way. managed to do that with no software, like no real time, like checking back and forth because it, it, it looks incredible. But just as an animator, all I was thinking when I was looking at that scene going, holy God, like <laughs> yeah, there's so many the characters. Now it's great because there's sometimes, you know, when you take a shortcut and say, you know, you could do that scene and you could probably just add in voices, you know what I mean? Or shoot through a character or two and make it seem like there's more. But I think Patty is always a little bit disappointed that you didn't even try because you're like, <laughs> You know, it just makes the story feel, I suppose it gives, it reduces the scope. Whereas when I saw all these characters, all your different voices in there as well, it was just like, I've watched it a couple of times and I always see something different. Even in the shots where I'm trying to not show the crowd, I try to just give the impression that they're still there. Like when they're fighting, some of the fight shots will start with a bunch of people like on the left and right of the frame. And then they just kind of leave the frame so that it's less work, you know. Okay, and just focus on what, what the main focus of the shot is. But just just having that movement in the shot, starting it off with a bit more chaos, and then it gradually just, you know, gets down to less work for you to do. You know, I feel like that sells it a lot better than just just be cutting everything so close and not showing anything at all moving. Yeah, you at least get to see them. Faking it as much as possible, basically. Yeah, it's just kind of a good staging, you know what I mean? And I think one of my favorite shots in the whole film is the, uh, the face swapping gag as he's being punched. I really enjoyed that. It was just a different facial expression. So it's something so simple, but it's something that's like, I love things that tie in to like the actual Lego-ness of it. Yeah, you know a bit I mean? of Lego like, humor, yeah. Yeah, punching them around. And I'd say that was a lot of fun kind of filming that and then seeing that come out and 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 kind of working so well. And did you- That was very difficult as well because there was a like sort of handheld-esque camera movement going on there. And yeah. the, the Spanish at the end, did you have to learn to be, speak a bit of Spanish or is that something you- you kind of already knew how to do well that line is just taken directly from taco trouble uh, okay yeah you know, as i was saying the film was inspired by taco trouble and other uh Biff and mario films so you know we, we probably chose spanish just so that we could use that line from taco trouble so it was all just it was just spoken by copying the you know the phonetic sounds i like the fact that the film has a you know direct reference to taco trouble and then you know later on we'd eventually collaborate to make Tiger Trouble too. so yeah that must have been a really nice kind of feeling kind of I suppose going from that as a kind of a reference to then actually getting to be sort of part of the story Mm -hmm. yeah and of course it was nice because it came about naturally you know we didn't approach them saying oh can we please make this like just in conversation it just came up naturally and and it's like oh you know we should collaborate on this and I really like the experience of collaborating with other people, especially because it kind of feels like once they've done their work, you you have to, you know, do your part then. You can't let them down. So a, a certain amount of pressure is very good for actually getting films done. You like making them for Brawl or for any other contest. Like, yeah, Parallel Panic, even though Parallel Panic was made over two years, but there was there was massive gaps in its production. I think that between all, we made a bunch of other contest entries. I think we made... 16 minutes worth of contest entries during the production of Parallel Panic. So it's longer wow. than the actual film. The actual but, you know, film. So because because the contests have deadlines, we can get the films done in good time rather than yeah. kind of on the back burner for the That's probably, time. that kind of actually leads me sort of, I suppose, nicely to sort of the last section uh, of the podcast because I'm just conscious of time. Just, mm-hmm. you kind of touched on this sort of advice. Do you find that like, deadlines like that are, are, are key like are you a better animator because of deadlines or do they kind of like stress you out or is there a nice sort of balance well i mean if you're talking raw stop motion i'd be a better animator without deadlines if i can you know take two days to make one shot then it's going to come out pretty good i hope but definitely as far as actually making films you know i think my worst problem is like 
just sitting down and starting on something like starting on the next shot you know i put it put it putting things off is, is a very big problem for me i think but with a contest deadline you can't put anything off you just have to get going and, and make it so and whatever really you have that, when you're done is like that's what you enter yeah, that's what yeah. you've got yeah so i do think that contest deadlines is a very good form of pressure for me anyway probably for a lot of other people yeah but, oh you know, absolutely if, if you look at all my films over the last couple of years except for parallel panic and tiger travel 2 they're basically all contest entries because it it makes it so i actually get to work <laughs> And I suppose we spoke about this earlier, just with you kind of arriving sort of around the, the sort of the birth of YouTube, let's say, for people at the moment, let's say, who might just be starting out or even currently running a YouTube channel, would you have any advice at all for them in terms of like, you know, from your experience, how you found kind of your YouTube channel? Well, as I was saying, you know, I, I'm not really conscious of views or, you know, gearing things towards views. I mean, I do. I like to make whatever I want to make, and then once it's done, I'll try and you know, put it wherever it might get seen. But you know, I'm not. I'm not really thinking about like optimization for for YouTube or or whatnot. It's all just hobby, and and really, where I find the most fulfillment is sharing it with community members and see what they think about it. You know, other other people who are good brick filmers. You know, those comments mean a lot. And where do you have any good or go-to places, say, bar YouTube, like forums or these communities that you like to post? Well, at the moment, it's basically all on Discord, you know, Bricks in Motion Discord, and the Brick Film Day Discord, and there's a few other Brick Film Discords. That's, you know, basically, that's where the activity is. That's where you can post a film and get a bit of a, an immediate response. Okay, rather brilliant. than I think that the forums, you know, they're, they've gotten a lot quieter in the last, uh, over the last decade. Um, and is there any advice that you'd give to someone, I suppose, like starting out on the first brick film? Is there anything that like when you were starting out, you wish you had someone who had said, hey, yeah, try this or do this? I suppose I, I very much wish that I'd started watching and studying films and good filming techniques a lot earlier. Because, you know, for many years, I was basically just influenced by other brick films. Uh, and wasn't really watching films and thinking about how I could use techniques in my own work. I mean, I guess for a good few years, I wasn't really approaching brick filming with much of a film interest, more of just a, you know, doing funny ideas. But yeah, as I was saying, you know, most improvements I made came about due to conscious thought and effort rather than just chipping away at it for years and hoping you just eventually get better. Okay. And, and when you say about the kind of film, sort of using film as a kind of a reference or a way, are you kind of just watching films in general and taking sort of inspiration from their look? Or are you kind of looking at like making ofs or, or things like that mm -hmm. or reading up about them? Or Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, because I, I buy films on Blu-ray, that's how I watch most films. So you, you'll get all the, the bonus features as well. And I, I'm kind of I, I kind of feel like if I, you know, went to the trouble of acquiring this on Blu-ray, I have to watch everything, you know. Okay. If, if, <laughs> I, mean, if, if I paid philosophy. for it, yeah, I, I ought to, you know, watch every bonus feature and listen to the commentaries and everything. So once I watch a film, I basically go through everything else that's on the disc as well. And okay. It's, you know, it, it depends, you know, some, some behind the scenes will be kind of just general, more fluff pieces, you could say. But some of them are really, you know, uh, nitty gritty stuff uh, especially i mentioned the shining earlier when i watch the behind the scenes of the shining there's talk of using different lenses to achieve different effects like like using a wide lens to travel through corridors will make the the walls kind of like you know rush sort of past okay and if That's you great also tip. path of glory by stanley kubrick when moving through the trenches in world war one you know it'd be similar it has a great feeling of movement to use a wide lens okay. like that and basically that's that's kind of before that, I didn't really know anything about what different lengths of lenses could achieve, you know. And now I could, if I was to return to the C920, now I'd know that it's a wide lens. So I'd gear the shots toward it being a wide lens, basically. Okay, I brilliant. didn't have any any idea about that before watching things like that. It was all cameras were just a camera and this the yeah, one you had. You just, yeah. you just point it and shoot, basically. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's the extent of it. And uh, I suppose just in, on, the, on, the, on the theme of, of advice, how do you get through a, a tough day, let's say? 
that's something we'd all like to figure out I yeah <laughs> i mean is your i suppose to rephrase it slightly is your philosophy do you ever just kind of sometimes call it quits and go you know what i'm getting a bit frustrated now this isn't working out i'll come back to it in the morning or is your philosophy to kind of just power through like find a way i think the weirdest thing is probably that once i start animating and i'm in the shot then it feel it's it's good then it's like the worst part is just sitting around and not doing anything and putting it off you know it it feels like such a massive hurdle to just start to just get going but then once i actually have gotten going i'm thinking why why was i so afraid of this why was i putting it off so much you know i'm enjoying the sort of zen of you know stop motion animation and like there's, there's nothing to it you just got to do it but it's so hard to just do it so i guess i guess i just have to always keep that in mind like remember the feeling you know, think to myself you know you've 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 taught all this before you've experienced all this before like you know the only way to stop putting it off is to just do it and once you start doing it then it's good it's it's, it's you get fine. into a rhythm that kind of fear yeah. i always have that slight fear before i start something where i'm like i know there's one bit in particular that's going to be difficult and i'm like oh i'm not looking forward to that part because i'm like I know how I kind of want to do it, but I don't know if it'll work out. And then you kind of get to that moment and you find that you kind of, you know, it's just, it's, it's increments bit by bit yeah. you get there. Once you get there, there's no direction to go other than just figuring it out. You know, you just, you, you have to do it. You have a task and you have to find out how you're going to get it done, I guess. You have to find a way. Yeah. I don't know. That's nice. And then I suppose just to finish up, is there any kind of one tool or thing that is kind of like your go-to like something that you find really helps when you're making a film, whether it's like the tiniest little tool or a brick or something that, that you find you use a lot that is a good kind of tip. Well, of course, you know, Dragon Frame certainly helps in every way, you know, creating animation. I can't believe that I went for so long without software, uh, but particularly now that I have Dragon Frame, I'd never go back. Yeah, I can't but believe from... when you were saying about the, the just videoing stuff and then going in and removing your like you know the frames that you wanted i was like geez i was blown away by how much work that must have been yeah well it's yeah it's so much quicker but it's also easier to make things better to just time everything better and just get the animation done and be able to see how it's going while you're shooting the shot but apart from that uh i i don't think so i mean it's hard to i mean i do use the brick like brick separators they're, they're useful of course i mean that's kind of just, that kind of goes without saying i guess i think yeah. i like the thing of your your clear um plastic brick for masking i thought that was a great uh kind of tip because something i never thought about uh that could like obviously you're still having to mask that out but like you said even the light coming through it that you can still get a natural you know you're not getting this big yeah. blocky shadow that then you're like how do i mask out the shadow as well and also another thing about the clear plastic i forgot to mention is like if you're trying to do masking for tack or brawl and you know you have very little time you can just kind of like you don't really have to get down to the edge like because it's clear that you can just you know remove most of it the most visible part and just leave leave where it connects with the figure and you don't really see it at all brilliant brilliant and i suppose the last thing would be just to uh um is there a place where kind of people could reach you or where's the best kind of um, platform or, or way to reach if people had questions or or kind of wanted to reach out well i'm always on the bricks and motion discord and of course you know i'd see any youtube comments but yeah bricks and motion discord definitely is a a good place you know people sometimes show up and ask of course i know about like old brick films and stuff people often show up and ask for ask for some brick films that they vaguely remember yeah that they've been looking for for a long time and people often point them to me Okay, so, yeah. you're like the uh, the the sage uh, <laughs> vault of knowledge. Like he, he'll know yeah. that. Go ask him. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Basically, yeah. Well, look, that's a that's a that's a great place to leave it. Just want to say uh, thank you so much for uh, mm-hmm. for taking the time to be on the show. And uh, yeah, yeah, best of luck with your next uh, brick film. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on and, and talking about Parallel Panic in particular because yeah, it was definitely a long time since I watched it. And you know, in in rewatching it again, I was looking at it and thinking, you know. This, this film is it's fun it has a good energy to it you know like with, with enough time i could now see it as like oh yeah this was good wasn't it you can appreciate <laughs> it kind of go back and i suppose there's probably yeah. enough time has passed where it stopped just being you know oh that project that you know, <laughs> yeah. especially because you, know, you spent two years i'd say you knew it inside out i was kind of thinking that 
in the years since then, oh, I've improved my filmmaking techniques so much. I'm going to, you know, return to Parallel Panic and think it's all just basic and, and whatnot. But I was thinking, you know, it has this sort of nice classic brick film, cartoony vibe to it. Yeah. No, oh, there's some really, really nice shots. So I think uh, I, I'm glad that this uh, this podcast was a way for you to kind of rediscover it. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, Sean. Great talking to you. Yeah, thank you. So that is it for this episode of Cartoon Cosmonauts. I'd like to say a huge thanks to my guest, Sean Willis, for coming onto the show and talking about his film, Benny and Lee, Parallel Panic. Be sure to check out his YouTube page, Silly Penta, for all his work. And you can also find him on Twitter. I'll leave links to both in the podcast description. If you'd like to get in touch with me, perhaps with some questions, feedback, or even to discuss your own short on the show, then you can find me online at Speak Broccoli on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Just look for the green broccoli logo. You can also email speakbroccoli at gmail.com. Thank you for taking the time to join me here today. I've been your host, Joseph Orr, and you've been listening to the Cosmic Sounds of Cartoon Cosmonauts.